Okay, hello everyone and uh, welcome to this webinar on creating and sharing your own open educational resources. Uh, my name is Sally Parsley and um, I'm the technical lead um, on the Open Education Programme at the International Centre for Eye Health here at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And I'm the, the webinar host for today. I'm really, this is the last in the series of five monthly uh, webinars we've been hosting, which have been looking to explore how we as eye health educators can use um, information and communication technologies to innovate and collaborate across traditional institutional boundaries and teaching methods. And, um, and today we're, we're looking at the practicalities for educators of using open educational resources. What are the reasons we do or don't use OER in our practice? And once we decide to use them, how can we get started? What are the key things we need to know and skills we should have? So I'm really delighted to have uh, two members of the two staff members from the University of Cape Town, South Africa, to present on this today. And I'm I'm really looking forward to, to what Glenda, Dr. Glenda Cox and Mr. Gregory Doyle have to talk to us about. But before I uh, before I hand over to the really interesting part of the webinar, I first have a little bit of housekeeping information. And then I would just want to give a little bit of introduction to what open education is, what OERs are, and why here at the London School we, we think they're very interesting. Um, for anyone who's really not um, attended one of our webinars before, and I apologize if you've been to a few and you've, you've sat through those couple of minutes a couple of times now. Um, so in terms of housekeeping, yes, as I've said, we'll hear our presentations first. So that'll take about half an hour. And then we'll have a Q&A session for about 15 minutes at the end. So as you listen to Glenda and Gregory and you have questions, please enter them into the questions tab um, on the menu. You should see a sort of menu on the right-hand side, uh, with, which opens up using an orange tab. So please send in your questions to me using that, and then I'll pose the questions in the Q&A session to our presenters. You can also download the presentations from the handout section of the menu tab. Um, and oh, sorry, I'm losing my notes. And uh, we'll also we're, we're recording this session, so just to let you know that that's happening. And probably in five or six days, we'll we'll have the recording and the transcript ready, and we'll be sending links to those to everyone who registered for the webinar. So if you have to leave early or you have trouble with the, uh, accessing the webinar, that don't worry, we'll be able to send you the, everything later on. Okay. So just to start with those definitions that I was talking about, um, open education can be defined is defined by people in different ways, and um, I think Glenda in particular will talk a bit more about this. And it's, it's very interesting once you start to think about it. But basically, underpinning this philosophy of open is the idea that knowledge is a public good, that um, and it should be available to everyone who needs it when they need it. And in terms of open education, what that kind of leads to is this idea that what, um, open education is activity reduced, to reduce barriers to participation in education and learning. And it can, it's, it can be all sorts of things. So it can be reducing uh, barriers, uh, reducing um, cost of education, so or the requirements to take part in education. So this picture is of uh, the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina which in the early 20th century got rid of its uh, entrance requirements. It opened up its courses to many more Argentinians than had been able to attend it before. So basically, if you had a secondary school uh, degree and you could pass a straightforward entrance exam, you could attend any of their undergraduate courses. So that's, uh, it's been around for an, a long time as an idea. Uh, other examples might be um, uh, like uh, online courses or uh, sharing uh, new ways of talk, opening up uh, ways to talk to each other, um, removing, um, reaching learners at a distance, and so on. There's too many to talk about. That's why I get into a muddle. I get all excited about the different ways we can do this. So, with the rising in, with the rise of the internet, of course, the focus of open education has moved online. It's a great opportunity to reach people at a distance, and also um, the costs of sh sharing materials start to come down significantly. So open educational resources are educational materials, which are usually online, but not necessarily, that have an open copyright license, which allows anybody to access them, download them, use them in their own practice, change them as they need to do, and then share them with their own 
learners or other educators for free and without asking for permission from the original publisher. And that's a huge change from traditional copyright, which insists that if you're going to reuse a material, you have to ask permission of the original copyright owner. And here are some examples of uh, open educational resources that we produced here at the, the International Centre for Eye Health. And on the right there is an example of, the, of a logo of a, of a common open copyright license, Creative Commons. And I think Greg is going to talk about that a bit more later on. Um, so in addition to open educational resources, um, have come along open courses. So this is where you take a bunch of uh, materials and you deliver a whole course using them. So typically open courses are free to access to anyone. So there's no uh, registration restriction. If you have an internet connection and you're interested, you can access and use these courses for free. Um, some open courses don't use OER, but ours do. So it's as I was saying, open education is defined in different ways by different people. So ICH and OER, um, in 2014 we were getting excited about these potentials for OER to address some of the key challenges that we know eye care training is facing in the world. And we have covered, I'm not going to go into that today because I want to focus on uh, Gregory and Glenda's presentations. But um, Dr. Daksha Patel and Professor Alan Foster uh, from the International Centre for Eye Health, went into this in a lot of detail in one of our earlier webinars. So if you're interested in the challenges we face as eye care educators, I encourage you to follow that up and I'll share the link at the end of uh, the presentation today. So uh, we decided we wanted to reach out across our traditional boundaries. We've been running a master's course for many years, but we thought we could reach a lot more people if we got into this idea of open courses and open education resources. So we created our first open course, Global Blindness, Planning and Managing Eye Care Services, in 2014. And we have been running it on uh, the FutureLearn platform for the last couple of years. So we've had some more than 6,000 people have, have accessed this course so far. And we're getting very good feedback from both the learners and the educators who have had a look at the course, downloaded maybe one or two materials, and in some cases downloaded the whole course or taken the whole course itself and adapted it and used it in their own contexts. And the previous webinar we went, we had um, Professor Colin Cook from University of Cape Town and Dr. Niawira Mwangi from uh, Kenya who talked about their experiences of taking the whole course and using it in their own contexts. So we're very encouraged by uh, how, how positive our experience has been and we have also very lucky to have acquired some funding and we are in the middle of developing seven more open courses in key public health eye care topics. So just to let you know what's going on, we have four courses available at the moment, the Global Blindness one, our first one, two courses, a basic and a slightly more advanced course in ophthalmic epidemiology and another course uh, on eliminating trachoma. And again at the end of the presentation we'll uh, We'll share the, the link, I have the link so that you could access and register for these courses if you're interested. And we have four more courses uh, coming up soon uh, over the next couple of years. Uh, and diabetic eye disease we hope will be ready by the end of this year with retinopathy of prematurity, research methods in ophthalmology and uh, glaucoma by the end of 2019. Okay, so I hope that gives you a kind of sense of why we're why we're doing what we're doing and for where we're up to. Um, but today, we're really interested in how eye care educators get started and um, what are the reasons they get involved, how can they do it. So um, I'm very pleased to hand you on, first of all, to our first presenter, Dr. Glenda Cox. She's a senior lecturer at the Centre for Innovation in, in Learning and Teaching at the University of Cape Town. And her portfolio includes curriculum projects, teaching with technology innovation grants, open education resources and staff development. She's recently completed her PhD in education and her research focused on explaining why academic staff choose to contribute or not to contribute their teaching resources as open educational resources. Glenda believes that supporting and showcasing UCT staff who are excellent teachers both in traditional face-to-face -face classrooms and in the online world is of great importance. She's passionate about the role of open education in the changing world of higher education. Okay. Okay. Um, 
My presentation is going to be quite brief today and I'm hoping to just open up a few conversations around uh, possible tools and frameworks to look at, at open educations, open education in various institutions. So wherever you are as participants, um, to look at what's happening in your institution and whether your institution is kind of OER ready and then also whether you are OER ready. And a lot of this work um, comes from this project that I was involved on, the research on open education resources for development. So today I'm going to focus a little bit more on that. Um, so Sally's already introduced me. So I, I have done, um, I have recently completed a PhD, but I'm not going to be talking about that work today. Today I'm going to be focusing on, on the raw for d work. I'm going to talk a little bit about the evidence and um, what we're calling an OER adoption pyramid, uh, which looks at the barriers to OER, but also if those um, factors are in place, also enablers of OER, and then just a little bit on an open education practitioner example, um, and then I'll hand over to Greg. So. This amazing project that I was part of, this Research on Open Education Resources for Development project, um, consists of a number of different projects and I was the uh, sub-project leader on this project that looked at lecturers' adoption of OER. Um, and by adoption we mean um, contribution and use of OER. And I did this work with my colleague Henry Trotter, who would be here today if he could, but um, he is in fact traveling. So this is the, the project that I'd like to talk about. Uh, just to give you a general sense of the enormous scope of this project, uh, you can see how many different countries were involved, around about 100 different researchers looking at um, impact and use of OER and very specifically in the Global South. So we wanted to give um, a Global South perspective on OER use and impact and we felt that this was something that was missing in the literature uh, and wanted to actually get a better understanding what's happening across all these different countries. So an amazing project to be part of um, and my specific project with Henry, uh, we were based um, locally here in South Africa. And we looked at three different institutions, so that's essentially what this project is about. We looked at our own institution, UCT, which is a residential institution, around about 26,000 students. Um, traditional research institution with a kind of collegial culture where academic freedom is paramount. Um, and the copyright owner of teaching materials is the lecturers. And then we also went to the University of Fort Hare, um, which is more a rural institution, smaller, um, more of a bureaucratic environment where there are a number of policies, um, not always tightly implemented, but certainly lots of policies in place. Uh, and we also went to UNISA, a distance institution, very large, over 400,000 students. So if you're interested in this kind of uh, comparison between institutions and different institutional cultures. Uh, we've written quite a lot um, around um, the role of institutional culture um, and OER adoption. But in a nutshell, um, so this is this is a little bit just about the methodology. Um, so we interviewed academics at each institution, um, and the results I'm talking about here are the analysis of those interviews. Um, but really, in a nutshell, we were kind of, I don't know if it was disappointed, but we kind of, the people that volunteered for the interviews, we only had two that were really using and contributing OER. And once we started to look at our data, we realized that there are a number of factors involved. Um, and what we wanted to do was to come up with a framework so that we could compare the different institutions and the different factors that were um, barriers to OER adoption. And so we came up with this OER adoption pyramid, looking at these factors 
and my colleague Henry came up with this particular diagram of, of OER reduction. And so, as you're sitting listening to me now, perhaps you can think about your own institution and kind of through um, go through these different factors and think whether these factors are in place. So, in in the global south, um, right at the bottom of the triangle is the issue of access. This is not necessarily an issue more in the global in the global north where infrastructures are in place. But for us in the global south, um, it is often a very big inhibitor of OER. Uh, then this idea of permission. Um, so this is the legal side. This is the policy side. Um, at your institution, do you have copyright over your materials? So a very important aspect to consider. Then we found that awareness of OER is still a very big inhibitor. Um, at the University of Forte, very few of the academics who attended the workshops um, and who um, volunteered to be interviewed were aware of OER. Uh, then we have this issue of capacity. So do you have the technical skills to be able to use and create and find OER? And then moving up the triangle, the idea of availability. Um, can you find OER in the area where you're interested in? Um, are they available? And then at the very top of the triangle, a very complex section around um, individual volition um, and agency. So if all these other factors are in place, do you have a personal sense of value around sharing um, and making your materials available? And there's a lot written, and my thesis is kind of at the is based in that top triangle. That was what I was trying to understand um, in my thesis. So hopefully this framework is something for you to consider, to have a look at in your own institution and in your own work. And then, so if the factors are in place and um, you've decided you want to be an open education practitioner, you would like to go on this journey, um, then there are a number of so there are a number of factors to consider, and I must say it's quite an interesting area at the moment in open education. Um, at conferences I've attended recently, people are talking about this idea of open education practices. So it's a little more than the OER adoption uh, that I was talking about. It's more about really thinking about your practice as a teacher, as an educator, and opening up those practices. So I've just highlighted two different definitions, but there are many more definitions, and you might find one that you prefer. I would highly recommend, if you're interested in this area, to go and read the work of Catherine Cronin, um, who has this quite specific definition of open educational practices. And the link in the slide is to a paper that she's written um, that is very accessible. Um, and really an excellent overview of this topic of open educational practices. Um, and then just below that, uh, a definition by Martin Weller, which is really more loosely defined in a way, um, so that it kind of opens up a, a whole a realm of open practices uh, that really he talks about a change in educational practice because of the open nature of, it, of the internet. So quite an interesting area and very much the talk at the moment in the open education world, becoming this open education practitioner. Uh, so then just um, this slide kind of says, talks a little bit about pedagogy, which is really the kind of basis of this idea of becoming an open education practitioner is thinking about changing your pedagogy, thinking about changing the way you're teaching. So you're no longer bound to your classroom and your students. Now you can actually open up your materials to the rest of the world, uh, whether it's in blogging, it, it doesn't have to be um, contained in, in the traditional sense. And I'll talk about the ways of opening up in, in a while. But you might also be sitting there and thinking, oh, you know, my materials, I'm, for the way I teach, mm, I don't think I have materials that are easily shareable. Um, and that is a constraint. So 
there are constraints and, and people are concerned about um, opening up their pedagogy and there's a fine line between openness and privacy and Catherine Cronin uh, talks about this extensively this idea of what you make open and what you keep private um, and also in terms of use sometimes it is difficult to find relevant OER um, I mentioned that earlier in the availability aspect of the triangle and then just on to my second last slide just an example of how I've tried in my own way to be a little bit more of, a, of an open education practitioner or scholar uh, where the data for the Rule 4D study is, has been made openly available um, so you can go and access my interview data and the questions. Um, I'm trying to publish an open access journal so people can actually read what, about what I'm doing. Um, in terms of open education resources, a good place to start is to sh simply share your slides and slide share with the Creative Commons license and actually extend your work out into the open. Uh, at UCT we have Open UCT, which is our repository. My thesis is there, available for anyone to read. Um, and then I, I am not a prolific Twitter user, um, but it is a very good way of communicating all these different forms of openness. And then on to my final slide. Uh, this uh, slide was developed by, by my colleague Sarah Goodyear who has done a lot of work on, on open scholarship and teaches workshops on open scholarship. Um, and I won't go into too much detail because of the sort of time constraints, but it's quite, kind of a nice process for maybe you to think of in your individual work. Where you are, what your profile looks like online, how you could perhaps extend your outputs online and how you could communicate what you're doing online. So just a kind of a step-by-step -step process of thinking about how you could move to be an open education practitioner or open scholar. And then this is my final slide, is just uh, some links which you might find useful to the Raw for d work to the Open Education Consortium site that has um, a phenomenal um, range of institutions with open materials available. To highlight the fact, um, the third link is the Year of Open. 2017 is the Year of Open. Um, and the, this is a wonderful website that features an, a particular aspect of open each month, like open science, open pedagogy, open data, um, open education resources, very useful um, place to go and have a look at what's going on. And then if you are in Africa, OER Africa is a particularly useful website. So that's kind of all I want to say for now. I'd like to hand over to, to Greg. Thank you so much, Glenda. That was super interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll do all the uh, presentation, the, the switching on and off of screens. But I was it's so interesting to hear you talk about the open education uh, practitioner and thinking using open as a way to think about your practice and then these different spaces about what you want to keep private and what you want to keep open and whether you want to uh, adapt and not, maybe not share or maybe start to sh the journey of creating and sharing your own OER. It's um. Great. Yeah, and Catherine Cronin's work is, is extremely interesting, and I yes. echo what you said there, yeah. Okay, right. Let's... Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'm, I'm just, make Greg a presenter. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, and we're just seeing your screen now. Fantastic, open educational resources. Great, I shall mute myself. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Glenda and, and Sally. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about, as soon as I find out where the right buttons is, there we go, um, is more focusing on what we've been doing regarding OER in the Faculty of Health Sciences at UCT. Uh, obviously what I'm saying is in the context of, of the broader institution, um, that institutionally I think UCT is, is extremely open and there are lots of avenues and resources on the institution itself uh, where you can get information regarding OER. Uh, UCT has been involved with the Cape Town Open Ed Ed OER Declaration, the 2011 one. Uh, UCT has got a policy related to, to openness. Uh, we start had a 
directory in 2010 that changed into a repository in 2014. Uh, we've got the library, we've got the IP office. So those are all the resources that we have available on campus when it comes to, to OER. So the process that, that we follow in the faculty and what I'll briefly speak about is how we raise awareness around OER, um, how do we find content to, to publish as OER, and what is the process that, that we go through um, in the faculty itself. Um, I just need to add as well that I'm the e-learning manager in the faculty and we have a team of, uh, we are a team of five staff members who support e-learning in general. So everything from lecture recording um, to video recording uh, to our LMS and obviously also content creation and helping uh, staff publish their OER. So if I talk about the first two aspects first. Um, so those are some of the enabling factors that helps us. Um, that our culture at uh, UCT is very much, as I said, open. Staff got the freedom to, to do almost anything. And that's related to the fact that uh, UCT assigns the copyright of all the teaching material that they create back to them. Uh, UCT retains the use of that material. But then because the staff are the copyright owners, publishing them as OER, uh, you don't have, they don't have to uh, jump through hoops or, or they don't have a lot of red tape that they've got to go through. Uh, initially when we started this in 2008, our dean, um, the top right hand side, Marion Jacobs, uh, was very supportive of OER. Uh, and, that's, and that helped that we had top down uh, support. Uh, Matuma Ramifikang on the left hand side at the top, is one of our uh, OER creators and, and one of the champions in the faculty. The same as um, Johan Klopper at the bottom, uh, who won an open course consortium. He's a surgeon, uh, he's a professor in the faculty, and we often hold those two up as examples uh, when staff come to us and say, I am too busy, I have too much to do, uh, that I cannot do it. Uh, then we show them, you know what, there are others that, that have done it. And that really helps us to, um, with our marketing of OER in the faculty and also to, also to get others interested in, in creating their own OER. Um, we also, when we go to do presentations and workshops, we tell people why uh, they need to publish OER. So what, what is it in it for them? Because that, all, that is always the issue that comes up. Um, we've had one uh, academic who, who felt that he wants to hold on to his teaching material uh, so that one day he can create a, a book out of it. Um, so there are various reasons why people don't want to do it, but, but for the most of it, uh, staff in the faculty are pretty open to, to having their work published uh, as OER. Um, and it's all about um, marketing, social responsiveness, uh, fostering connections, uh, cl future collaborations, when others can see what they are involved in. Um, that students are able to have an idea of what the course entails because the course material is up uh, uh, for, f uh, for free. Um, then obviously uh, we need to deal with the questions that academics ask. And, because we deal with different staff members uh, and they often come to us for assistance, uh, we're able to answer most of these questions um, because we find that most of them have the same questions, which really makes it easier for us uh, because then we're able to help them think through what it is that they want to do and how do they want to do it. Uh, I mean, obviously, if they come and ask who will pay for their time. We said we can't. We can't do that. I mean, then then you're on your own. If you're doing this for money, then obviously you're doing this for the wrong reason. Uh, but when it comes to where do I find the information, what software do I need? Uh, if they want to know if the material are being downloaded, then those are the kind of questions that that we can help them with. The next step for us is clearing the copyright and package, packaging the contents. So we've got we've got a staff member that's come to us. Uh, they've got material that they would like to to. Uh, create or publish as an OER and what really helps us is that we've got one person that has got information about where to publish, what is the different licensing options uh, so they don't, they don't have to go and talk to one person. 
instead of having to send them to the library or maybe to the uh, intellectual property office. Uh, most of the questions that they have we can answer right here. Somebody sits with them, ask them what do you want to do, uh, let's look at some options. Um, in the beginning in 2008 we had one person dedicated to OER. That's all, that's all that she did. Um, but since 2012 the, the post has changed and we, it's no longer a person focusing on OER but more focusing on helping staff um, create content. Uh, and the fact that that content is published also as an OER is almost a, a byproduct. Uh, and that's what we're trying to, to cultivate in the faculty. Not OER is something separate, but something, uh, but it's, it's what they do. It's part of what they do. Um, so these are some of the things that we look at when we create OER, uh, where we're going to publish, where we're going to host it, uh, I, others able to, to find it, uh, what kind of license do we put on there? Um, is it freestanding? Is it not? Uh, what are the copyright content? Is there any copyright content in what you have already that needs to be cleared? And that's probably the, the most time consuming aspect of this. Um, because what often happens is that uh, academics will have images or other content uh, in their teaching material uh, for which they don't necessarily have copyright clearance for. So we will either try and get the copyright clearance for them or we will redraw it or find alternative uh, images because most of the time it's image related to images uh, for them. Uh, what we also try and tell them is that it doesn't have to be perfect uh, because it's surprising how often academics don't want to let go, don't think that their work is, is good enough to, to go out there into the wide, wide world. Um, but I'll speak about quality assurance just now, but we keep on telling them. It, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, our approach to, to what we produce, uh, we've done entire courses, uh, but then also manuals, videos, presentations. Uh, what we try to do from our side is package it in a way that it's easily um, for others to download, but it's also easy, easy to find and to go through. Um, as I said, the person that deals with it for us, they've got knowledge of the licenses and they are able to assist the, uh, the lecturer with what kind of license do they, do they want. Uh, and most of the time we publish it, um, share like, uh, non-commercial, um, and that's one that we, a non-derivative um, probably most of the time. Now, we've made a decision a long time ago to have most of our material HTML based. Uh, so in other words, even when uh, the content is a series of PowerPoints or a series of videos, we'll, we'll package it in such a way that it can easily be accessed via the, the web. Uh, the advantage of that for us is it's easy to, 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 to download it. So you zip it together in a zip file and somebody who doesn't want to uh, view it online, wants to download it, it's easy to do that. Uh, if it's HTML based, you don't need a special, you don't need special software to, to access it. Uh, and that is just one example that, that we've done. Uh, in fact, that is the one by Matuma Rafikem that I mentioned earlier on. Uh, Articulate Storyline is another package that we use, but even when we use that simply because of uh, some of the interactivity that it allows, um, we will still export it as an HTML file and publish it online as that. Now, in terms of reviewing the OER and quality assurance, that as I said uh, already, we're encouraging individual academics to, to upload their own material and to, and to maintain it. Um, we have just one person that deals with this and that is just part of what they do. So if we can train others to, to do it themselves, then it means less work for her. But she's always available, or this person is always available to those who need assistance. Uh, what we've seen time and time is that uh, if there is a dedicated body that staff members can go to for assistance, that really makes the process much smoother. It really encourages them to, to come forward to publish the materials OER uh, because they know that somebody can help them through that. Um, most of the material that we publish as OER are teaching material. So the academics, the lecturers are, are using that in the actual teaching. 
So when it comes to quality assurance, we, we keep on reminding them that if it's good enough for them to use in their teaching, it's good enough to, to publish as OER. Uh, we don't have quality assurance per se, although the, the library does have a look at it in terms of copy, copyright compliance, um, but most of the time the quality assurance lies with, with the individual. In terms of publishing it and publicizing the, the OER, um, Open UCT is our repository and that's where we you'll find links to most of our material. We don't always um, use the Open UCT as a repository and a directory. We use this as a directory, otherwise you can go there and you can have a look at the material. But we've stored material on our LMS, we've stored it on YouTube, uh, we've stored it on SlideShare, we stored it in different places. Um, for one reason, sometimes it's easier to have something on YouTube, both in terms of accessibility, uh, that we don't have to worry about that. Our learning management system also, uh, the, it is accessible and uh, you're able to view it from a mobile device, etc. So we don't have to worry about issues like that because the platform on which the content is does it for us. Um, people find uh, the content various ways, most of the time via, via Google, but also OER Commons. And in fact, for some of our academics, we publicize their content on Open UCT and OER Commons. And that's the great advantage about OER, is that you can put it in multiple, multiple places and copyright and copying it is not, not an issue. Uh, the one thing that we do encourage uh, that some of our staff don't, or a lot of staff don't take up, is the, the whole reuse issue. That we encourage them not to reinvent the wheel. If it's, if it's out there already, uh, why not make use of it uh, instead of spending time on creating content from scratch? So these are some of the places that, that we go to find or search content for, for staff members. And again, if the staff member doesn't have the time or the ability to, to do this, uh, we will help them with this. You'll notice that uh, LSHTM is there, and in fact, one of the, the courses that Sally spoke about early on, the Managing Eye Care, is being used in our PG DIP and uh, master's program on ophthalmology, um, because the content that we're currently teaching at, at UCT is almost exactly what, what was published by, by, by Sally and her team. So it makes total sense to reuse the same material instead of uh, creating material from scratch. Uh, finding OER, there's various places, all of those are different uh, sites that you can go to find OER and often the problem is that there's so many sites you don't know where to, to turn. And again, like we have one person here that's got knowledge about most of that and this, our staff really, academics really find it useful. Um, so in summary, I mean, we do have challenges, uh, still there's um, and awareness around OER, there's the sustainability issue, and the culture of not sharing uh, is, still, is still a problem, and it is labor intensive. Um, that uh, for long, for some time, we, we have to struggle with part-time staff. Uh, we train staff up, they leave. Um, that means we need to retrain the new one again, and I don't think we're using students enough. Uh, at the same time, like I said, we have cha we have champions, we have top-down support. Uh, the awareness is growing. Uh, and we encourage lectures whenever we can. Uh, we've got a UCT policy that really helps. Uh, we've got a full-time expert that helps them. And we basic we are we have created uh, manuals and there are presentations to help staff to to find OER. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greg. That was super interesting as well. Um, you guys do amazing work and. Um, and I'm always so impressed by what you achieve at UCT. I was I'm so time uh, conscious during these webinars that I didn't introduce you, Greg, for which I thoroughly apologise. Um, the Greg and his team have have been working with us and um, partners to adapt uh, OER uh, with us. So working with uh, Nia Weira and Michael in Kenya to adapt and Coexa to adapt uh, the Global Blindness Course and. Um, We've learned so much from working with you, Greg, just about the practicalities, remembering the offline use, um, 
keeping the HTML going. And um, uh, so I just wanted to make sure that I acknowledge that in this webinar. So um, thank you. And also, I was very interested. <laughs> thank you. Not at all. Thank you. And um, I was very interested in, in what you said about the institutional policy being a, a huge help. I, I think that is really key. And that was something that Glenda talked about too, wasn't it? However, I shan't hog the questions. So we've had some questions come in. Uh, I can just, I'm just trying to unmute you, Glenda. There we go. No, Hopefully you can unmute yourself, Glenda. So um, I'm, going to, I'm going to ask you both a couple of questions and then you can choose who can answer first. So uh, we have, we've had a couple of questions actually on evaluating the quality and you did talk about that Greg and you kind of leave it to the, at UCT you leave it to the um, uh, educators to self-assess the quality largely. So the questions that have come in are, um, does teaching quality improve when using OER? So this is slightly different. So does, do educators, when they start to use OERs, is your uh, experience in research finding that they're, um, they innovate with their teaching and uh, improve the quality? And also, what's the student's perception of the use of OER? Do they perceive it as, as good as sort of traditional, say, textbooks or materials? Or are there, have you come across uh, concerns about the quality of the OER? Uh, do you want to have a go at that first, Greg? Okay. Um, I think the teaching quality does improve because now when we when we let staff know, okay, if you publish this as an OER, it's going to go into the wide, wide world out there, uh, then yes, then suddenly we have concerns. Oh, let me go back to that and to that and make it a little bit better or explain a little bit better. So I think, I think yes, uh, but I don't think noticeably so uh, in the sense of the differences after staff is being aware of what it does it mean to be an OER isn't that great uh, to have warrant their worrying, uh, if I can put it that way. Um, because most of the, in fact, all the material that we publish as OER are being used in teaching at the moment. Uh, and that we keep on trying to tell them it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, in terms of students' perceptions of OER, and in fact, we did do a study in the one program and and the, the students love the OER because it was something they didn't have to pay for. Uh, it's something that was free. Uh, so, so, so they, yeah, so it, it was as good as the other material that was available. Yeah, and I think some studies in America are finding that too, aren't they? The, the college textbook studies and uh, where the, they're comparing the OER and the standard textbooks for courses and there's no difference. No difference. Um, Glenda, do, would you like to add to anything to this question on evaluating the quality of the OER and student perceptions and does it help um, improve teaching? Do our educators finding that it helps them improve their teaching practice? Uh, yeah, so in my in my thesis I went into the issue of quality um, in quite a lot of detail actually um, and I did find for people who weren't contributing it was a very big barrier. So they were not contributing because they felt their materials were not of good enough quality. And which was quite strange because generally they were brilliant lecturers and their materials actually were of good quality. So it, it kind of, uh, you know, there was a, I used a, a theoretical approach to kind of try and explain why some people are so concerned about quality, which I won't go into now. So I, I do think it's, there's, there's almost a, there's a real difference between a contributor and a non-contributor. And most of my contributors were not worried about quality at all. They were happy to go ahead um, and, and use the materials and they were as good enough for students, as Greg said, they were good enough to be shared. So yeah, there are, it's, a, it's a very interesting area, the, the area of quality. Um, and in terms of um, the idea about what students think, uh, I think you know the quality is related to use. So if it's a good material, it'll be used, um, and uh, that's that's the principle of openness: is to put it out there and and see what use actually occurs. 
Mm. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I was just thinking, I think I came across, it's, there's a link, isn't there, with being able to critically evaluate in, information, feeling confident and skilled that you can assess the quality of any information, isn't there? So, is it published? Um, is it up to date? Um, um, can you see any mistakes in it? If you can see mistakes in it, there will be other mistakes. And so there's a kind of a digital sort of capabilities aspect, isn't there? That yes. Am I being really fluffy? <laughs> rather than having a, a, a sort of a, a matrix or a rubric of things you have to check boxes you have to tick off, it's about assessing each material as you, as you encounter it. Yes, I agree. And, and Greg had a list of kind of um, kind of aspects to consider around quality, around usability, and um, but yes, I think it's 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 about the person who's contributing and their view on quality. And you know, one way of thinking about it is the beauty of OER is that it can be updated and edited and can have versions. It's mm. not a fixed published item that cannot be edited and. You know, some of the most successful textbooks, um, um, Greg didn't mention Johann Fagan, but he's also a most incredible um, a, a surgeon in, in health science, and he's shared his, um, his work in an open textbook. And his philosophy is he's improving it all the time. So, mm -hmm. so that is the beauty of, of OER, as opposed to a book that gets published in a particular version and is fixed. Um, so the the strengths, the OER has those strengths in itself uh, that need to be considered. Absolutely. So, oh, I'm going to I'm going. We're, we're kind of running out of time, so I'm going to move on. Or oh, the quality is super interesting. Um, so I have a question from Susan Evans about measuring impact of OER resources. That has a complicated question, Susan. Um, uh, what, Susan, what, what feedback do you get from users um, at UCT and in your research and what types of resources do users find most beneficial? Is there any information on that or which kind of resources uh, have better uptake? Do you have evidence on that? Uh, Greg? Um, the feedback that we normally give to staff is around uh, how many times have the resource been downloaded? Because those are the statistics that we're able to, to obtain. And again, this uh, relates to the quality assurance issue. Um, because we tell staff members, if others find it useful, they will download it. If mm -hmm. they don't download it, it means that they're not finding it useful. But mm -hmm. luckily, we haven't come across that case when something has not been downloaded at all. Uh, so that's one of the impact fa uh, factors that we look at in terms of OER that has been published by staff in the faculty. Yes, I think that's good, straightforward uh, in, uh, methodology, method, isn't it? you just like, nobody's using it, it's not useful. <laughs> um, Glenda, do you have anything to add? Have you come across anything else? I, yeah, I think there's also, uh, you know, it, for some people, the, the kind of, this idea of who's using and, and how much it's being used is very important. And I think in the OER world, we understand this. Um, but yes, you know, as, as Greg said, sometimes it's just about downloads. Um, and sometimes you could say, you know, sort of in different countries, and but you can't get more specific than that. Mm -hmm. But we often encourage academics, uh, you know, to put contact details in their OER. They're not going to be flooded with requests. But we mm -hmm. have had very interesting stories where people have... Uh, approached the academic and said, oh, I'm using your course in Saudi Arabia, or I'm using your course here. So there is that kind of um, informal feedback. Um, one of the the aspects that's kind of in the future, and I'm not quite sure how Creative Commons, how far Creative Commons are with this, but you know, as you know, all open education resources will have a Creative Commons license in it, um, or on it. Um, and depending on um, how you embed that license, you can also embed um, a URL with, with that license. And what Creative Commons are trying to work at now is kind of a tracking system where you can actually get a little bit more information about how your resource is being used. Uh, so this is 
technically it's clearly very challenging, but I know that that is on their radar um, in the future. Uh, so that's something to look forward to. That's very interesting. That would that would provide so much information into it. At the moment, they kind of go off into the ether, and um, you may not hear from them again. But I want. Wanted to pick up with what you were saying about um, uh, sort of serendipity and new connections, and that's something we have definitely experienced from our uh, program of developing OER and courses. When we started, we just thought we would make a course and and try and tell everyone that they could reuse it if they wanted to. But it's led to many new um, partnerships and uh, 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 developments and reuses. And so, you know, for instance, we've we've moved on to try and translate the content and that is not something that was there at the start that came out of conversations that opportunity later on so that being open and then the networking and connections as part around the object itself is is a very i think powerful part of it isn't it back to that oep open educational practice you were talking about yes. <clears throat> okay i think i need to wrap up um and let everybody have their lunch or finish their afternoon <laughs> Um, I have one more uh, question about the OER adoption pyramid. Um, can this is from Datchat? Can we use it to assess institutional and individual practitioners? I think you were talking about the institutional use mostly. Um, in access, and I'm sorry, and I'm finishing the question. In Africa, where access is a huge concern, uh, Glenda, do you have ideas and experiences on how this is? being addressed within the African context? So that's kind of two questions in one. Sorry, so can the adoption pyramid be used institutionally and for individuals? And do you know of um, approaches towards uh, addressing this access issue in education? I think that's the question. Um, yeah, so we, we created the, the adoption pyramid to look at institutions, but I think, you know, as I was talking about it, Definitely as an individual, uh, you could also consider whether you feel all those aspects are actually in place for you, whether you want to move forward to be an open education practitioner. So uh, yes, I think it could be used um, for an organization, institution, and, and on an individual level. Um, and in terms of approaches for, for accessibility, I think Greg could probably also talk to this a little bit, but I think there are lots of moves towards, you know, we do think that open education resources need to be online. Um, and increasingly we know that that's not realistic. But there's no, absolutely no reason why an open education resource is not necessarily, uh, you know, something that's printed out um, or that's available on a mobile device perhaps uh, or something that, um, for example, there have been cases where materials have been downloaded onto a hard drive and then accessed at a rural school. Uh, so they don't need the internet, the materials are there and they can use them. So people have experimented with a lot of different models to actually try and um, extend the use of OER into areas where there is no electricity or there is no internet. So there are a number of, of models that have been explored. Um, so for example, OER Africa have considered a number of these options in the work that they've done. But uh, yeah, perhaps Greg could also talk, he might have had some experience um, around uh, making OER more accessible. I mean, the, the ones that Glenda spoke about, uh, giving, giving participants or those who use it the option. So we we present the content as an HTML file, uh, but then also there are the PDFs that they can download. There's a zip file that they can download. Um, so it doesn't help to make it available only online and someone doesn't have uh, internet connectivity to be able to access it or only have internet connectivity at various times. And that is what we found, in fact, in our postgraduate programs where we have students from various other places in Africa uh, one of the requirements is internet access, and they say yes, but once a week. So they they can make a plan, uh, but you need to make sure that you make it as easy as possible for them for um, for the content or the OER to be mobile, so to speak. 
Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I, I'm running over time, so I'm going to wrap up. Um, but thank you again, both. Those were two really interesting presentations. Um, I hope they have in, inspired our uh, participants as well. And um, I just want to finish off by uh, thanking our funders, without which uh, our webinars and our programs would not be happening. And if, as a participant, you're interested in our ICH open courses and in the OER and as a starting place maybe for your own practice, here are a couple of, here's our web address where you can register. And also if you sign up to our email list, that's where we announce new courses. So if you're interested in the diabetic eye disease course later or the glaucoma or uh, retinopathy of maturity and so on, that's the uh, link there on our website. So you can download this presentation from uh, the handout section here for later and also from Glenda and Greg as well. So um, I'm going to, um, that's it, I'm going to leave, stop waffling on and thank our presenters again. Um, I know they're very busy people so it's very kind of them to talk today and thank you to participating um, and take care. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Bye. Thank you. Bye.